Okay, let's start the webinar. Today we're going to cover the topic KubeDB database user management using Cube Vault. And for this particular topic, we have Saki Balamin with us. He is our software engineer and the genius behind this project, this Vault thing. So, Saki, you can start. Yeah. Thanks, Rakib, for the kind introduction. So basically, uh, Tamal is the genius behind it, and we're uh, basically a bunch of developers uh, working on the Kube Vault team right now. So uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to another webinar on Kube Vault. So on our last webinar, we basically discussed about the various features of Kube Vault. So if you haven't watched that already, uh, it's recommended that you watch that later. But our today's agenda is managing KubeDB database user management using Cube Vault. So here is our table of contents. So uh, in today's webinar, we'll deploy a Vault server using Cube Vault. We'll deploy a database using KubeDB. Then we will enable the database secret engine to the Vault server, and we'll create secret engine roles. Then we will issue user credentials in two different means. First of all, using the secret access request, and secondly, using the secret role binding and secret provider class. Then we'll see how we can revoke user access. And lastly, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, during this webinar, if you have any question, any queries, uh, please feel free to ask in the Zoom chat. I think that should do fine. Uh, and also, uh, after the webinar, you will definitely get a chance to ask your queries. Okay. So before diving deep into the demo and stuff, so let's take a look at some general practices and daily to day to day activities in our database user management system. So it is very important to develop and maintain a security policy for every database, right? This security policy establishes methods for protecting your database from accidental or malicious destruction of data or damage to the database inf infrastructure. And each database can have an administrator referred to uh, as the security administrator, who is basically responsible for implementing and maintaining the database security policy. And the day-to-day -day activities of a DB admin could be managing users and resources. So to connect to the database, each user must specify a valid username, password that has been previously defined to the database. An account must have been established by the user with information about the user being stored in the data dictionary. On the other hand, managing user privileges and roles are also the responsibility of the DB admin. So privileges and roles can be granted to other users by users who actually have the grant access or the grant privileges to do so. So the granting of roles and privileges starts at the administrator level. Again, you can monitor or record selected user database actions, including those performed by administrators. You can monitor system-wide actions as well as actions performed on individual database objects. At the same time, predefined user accounts can also be used. So this predefined user accounts may also be used for giving users access in DB, which may be set by the DB admin beforehand. But what do we do in a break glass situation? So what do we do? when our DB credentials are compromised or leaked. The DB admin must also be prepared for such scenarios like this to reduce the blast radius in case of any security leak. And how do we actually provide the DB credentials to the Kubernetes application? So providing database credentials for Kubernetes applications has always proved operationally very challenging. And for optimum security, we ideally need to implement the following requirements for database credentials. For example, each Kubernetes pod or resources should have a unique set of credentials, and those credentials should be disabled or deleted when they are not anymore used. And those credentials should be short-lived and rotated frequently. And only this access should be restricted by the application function. That means when a system which only needs a, read, a specific table or a specific schema, then it should have only the access uh, which grants this particular purpose, nothing more than that. So while these requirements are essential for reducing the blast radius in the event of an attack, they are operationally very challenging. The reality is that without automation, it is impossible to satisfy them completely. And Vault solved this problem by enabling operators to provide dynamically generated credentials for the applications. 
Vault manages the life cycles of credentials, rotates them, and revokes them as required. And we, the Cube Vault, enables you to get all these benefits, benefits in a more simpler and consistent way. Uh, so um, I have provided the resources that you need to get started with KubeDB or Cube Vault. You can get your 30 days trial license from the uh, link I provided above. And you can also get the installation right from the link. I have already installed the Cube Vault and KubeDB Enterprise Operator Chart in my system. I have also installed the Secret Store CSR driver and the Vault specific CSR provider that I'm going to use later in this demo. So, yeah, it's time to deploy our Vault server. But before deploying it, what is a Vault server? So a Vault server is a Kubernetes CRD, which is used to deploy a HashiCorp Vault server on a Kubernetes cluster in a Kubernetes native declarative way. And when a Vault server is created, the Kubefault operator will deploy a Vault server and create necessary Kubernetes resources required for the Vault server. And a Vault admin is the person who will be responsible for provisioning the Vault server. Uh, let me uh, briefly uh, discuss the YAML here. So we can see the kind, which is Vault Server, and I have specified the name and namespace, and I'm using the version 1.8.2. I'll be using uh, three replicas. I will uh, describe the highlighted part a, a moment later. Uh, as the ancillary option, uh, I am using the Kubernetes secret. So it will generate five secret, and the Vault will record at least three of them to unseal it. As the auth method, I am using Kubernetes, and as a backend, I am using Raft. And Prometheus monitoring is also enabled, and termination policy is to, set to do not terminate. So before this release, uh, we didn't have this particular field. So what it does is uh, we have adapted to the Kubernetes double append method for our Vault server. So before this field was introduced, any particular secret engine could have been attached to the Vault server. But for security purposes, we have allowed secret engines field, basically what, uh, which indicates that you can allow or disallow any particular namespace or any particular secret engines. So we're allowing all namespaces here, and we're only allowing the MongoDB secret engines here. So no other secret engines can be attached to this particular vault server. So let's deploy the vault server. So I have applied the Vault Server YAML. Let's take a look at the status. As you know, uh, Vault provides a dynamic reflection of face. We can see the port zero is trying to uh, get up and running. So we have already one replica ready. The second one is trying to come. And Vault Server currently phase in critical. So Vault Server should also create the secret that you can see here, the Vault root token and Vault unseal keys. So we have two ready replicas. Let's wait for the last one. So our Vault server is ready. We have all the replicas ready, OK? All right. So now we want to deploy MongoDB database using kubedb. So let's take a look at the MongoDB YAML. So, uh, so I'm using the kubedb provided uh, MongoDB, uh, the sharded one. And I've provided the kind, the name, and the namespace. And the version is 4.4.6. And I'm using the replica set and also using the three replica class. And I have also given the storage information here. So now uh, DB admin will be responsible to provision the database. So let's do it. So 
So we can see that in the DB namespace, MongoDB zero instance is coming up. It's currently in the pod initializing phase. Let's take a look at its status. So we can see the dynamic status also here. We have already one pod up. Let's wait for the two more pod. So another pod is up. We have two ready replicas. Let's wait for the last one to get ready. So we have our MongoDB ready. All the instances have come up. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we have our MongoDB database and the vault server already up. Now, what DB admin can do, he can enable secret engine. So we have deployed the MongoDB database and we're going to enable a Mongo secret engine. So the kind is secret engine, but basically what is a secret engine, right? A secret engine is a Kubernetes CRD, which is designed to automate the process of enabling and configuring secret engines in a vault in a Kubernetes native declarative way. And secret engines are generally enabled in a particular path in vault. And in this way, each secret engine defines its paths and properties. So to the user, secret engines behave similar to a virtual file system, which supports basically read, write, and deletion operation. So in our particular secret engine, we have provided the name and the namespace, and we need to provide the vault reference that we have declared earlier and deployed it. And we're um, enabling the MongoDB secret engine. So we need also need to provide the database reference here. So one change is, uh, I think I should highlight here. So before this release, uh, the users needed to provide the database path, but for user convenience, we have, uh, we have decided that will dynamically generate the part based on the name and the namespace given, okay? So let's deploy the secret engine. So we can see the secret engine, which is in success state, the MongoDB secret engine, okay? All right. So now once the admin have the enabled the secret engine, he can predefine some roles in the vault. So let's say we're going to declare two different role. One is for the reader role and another for the reader writer role. So we're going to create two MongoDB role here. So what is a MongoDB role? So a MongoDB role is a Kubernetes CRD, which allows a user to create a MongoDB database secret engine role in a Kubernetes native way. So uh, when a MongoDB role is created, the cube vault operator creates a vault role according to the specification. So in the MongoDB role here, we're giving the name and the namespace, and we're also giving the secret engine ref with which it is going to be attached. And we're also giving the database creation statements. So we're specifying here, the DB name is MyDB, and in the role section, we're giving a role as only a read role, okay? So this is a read only role. On the other hand, we have a reader writer role. So we are also giving the secret engine reference here and we're giving the DB name and the roles, which is a read write role. So a DB admin can create some database roles beforehand and then use it according to his needs. So let's create the roles. So let's create the reader role first. Okay, so we have a MongoDB role, which is a reader role. And we also have created a reader writer role. Okay. Now, as the DB user, 
has enabled his database. He has created the secret engine. He has also created some roles in the database. He is ready to issue user credentials. Now, as a user, how can I get the credentials, right? So as I have told you earlier, we're going to use two different methods. One is by secret access request. So what is a secret access request? A secret access request is a Kubernetes CRD, which allows a user to request a vault server for credentials in a Kubernetes native way. A secret access request can be created under various role ref. For example, we're doing it for the MongoDB role. It can be also done for AWS role, GCP role, Elasticsearch role, etc. A secret access request has three different phases, waiting for approval, approved, denied, uh, that we're going to show in a, in a moment. And one thing I need to mention, before this particular release, we had separate access request for different databases and different cloud providers. For example, AWS access request, GCP access request, but for user convenience and for more simplicity, we have generalized this particular CRT here. So how does this work? So when a DB user make a secret access request, it goes into directly waiting for approval field. And as the DB admin, he can decide what to do with this particular access request. He can check out the spec and decide. So if he decides to deny it, then this will go directly into the denied phase and nothing will happen. Then user may change his particular specification. Then it will automatically go to the waiting for approval phase. And if the DB admin feels that yes, the secret access request needs to be approved and he approves it, then vault operator will issue credentials and also create Kubernetes secret containing those particular credentials. Uh, here we're uh, seeing a sample secret access request CRD. So we're uh, showing here the read-write access request CRD. So it is, uh, it is referring to a particular role, which is the MongoDB role, and name is reader-writer role. And it is, uh, we have also provided the subject to the user service account that the, this role will be bounded to. So let's uh, make a secret access request for the reader-writer role here. So our reader writer user can make secret access request for reading and writing ability in the database. So we are going to make a read write access request. We see the read write access request is currently in the waiting for approval phase. So if the DB admin decides to approve this request, he can simply use the give vault CLI, okay? So it's as simple as that. So if you approve it, then it will be approved and also the secrets will be generated. Now let's check out those secret. So we can see the secret generated here for our address access request. Now we want to see if these credentials are actually valid. User can access the database and do his operations in the database, okay? So let's export these credentials in our environment variable. Let's export the password also. And let me port forward from the database service. Now let's try to log into the DB. So we are logged into the DB. Now let's try to write some data first. Let's say we want to create a product schema. Let's try to insert one data. Let's sign to create a book of price 100. So I have created it. Let's try to read it from the DB. Uh, 
I can also read the values from the TV. Okay. So now another user can also try to access the data, but he may also need just to read the particular data, but not to write it. So let's make another secret access request. And this time it's going to be a simple read only request. Okay. So we have met another secret access request, which is our read only secret access request. Now DB admin can also, let's say, approve this request. So this one is also approved and our secret has been generated. Let's try to use those secret and log in our database. Let's check the secret first. So we can see our secrets are generated for the read access request. Let's export them as environment variable. Let's try to log into the database. Oh, we need to port forward it. Okay. What happened there? It is contained special symbol like dash in the password, which one probably <coughs> parsing in your bash like uh, special parameters. Okay. And password, I believe, yeah. should escape it. All right. You need to put a uh, double quote around the password, dollar password. Okay. Okay, so I need to port forward. Let's get the secret. No, you need to do the quotation around the MongoDB command. So export the password. No, export password without the single quotes. Okay. I think that will do it. Also, this is a fish, so fish could have its own type thing. You mean this one? Yes. Enter. No, no this is fine. So enter. Now go to MongoDB command. Now here we need to p. No, no, no. The, the dollar password. Put a double quotation around that. Okay. No, no, no. Not here. Go back to Mongo mydb dash u command. All right. Here, uh, put a double. No, no, no. Around the double password. Just around the dollar password. Yeah. Put a double quote here. Yeah. Uh, again, you just go bash, type bash. Yeah, enter, and then uh, do the mongo, mongo my db command. I think that will probably work. Yeah, the fish was doing some weird thing with there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the fish.
think the scope of fish. I think it's the fish you show. You also you also can rename or sorry uh, remove minus u and minus p definition and just run manga my db and inside the database use db dot uh, mechanism for authenticating with red password because like special symbol interpolated like a specific parameter in the bash right now also can be work. Yeah. I mean, uh, remove the dash u and dash p. Uh, yeah. yeah, remove just remove each any parameters and just run Monga by DB and inside uh, the shell uh, just do like DB dot out DB dot out uh, with uh, not how it's called like uh, why not just redo bash I mean that was working one okay. yeah well, let's just do bash yeah. Let's export it here. This is already exported because you had it in the fish. So if oh, you just do okay. Mongo MyDB common, that will log in already. Dollar password. And dollar password, not just password. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, guys, just do the simple. Just uh, yeah, do just echo, echo of username and echo of the password. And after that, just run Monga my DB without any parameters. And inside the database, run the common DB dot out and place inside the escaping the username and password. And after that, you will able to yeah. log in. Yeah, just do Mongo MyDB. No, 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 just run Mongo MyDB. Yeah, that's what the power was saying. So do Mongo MyDB. Yes, now do DB auth. If you're on the shell, on the Zoom chat, you can see DB auth. Uh, no, DB dot auth. Yeah, first bracket. Uh, in the, yeah, in the, within double quotation, you give the username. Uh, you have to give it the big 64 decoded. Yeah. 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 Comma, fast back, yeah, fast, double quotation, and then give it the password. Password. And that whole thing, yeah. Enter. Okay. Yes, I think that worked. Thank yeah. you, guys. So, yeah, I think the issues result, yeah. Okay. Sufficient bash, right? Okay. So, yeah, uh, we can read the data using those username and password. So now let's try to write some data into the database. So let's say we want to data pen. Let's say it's price is 200, but we cannot do it right because uh, we can see the error message which showing that this user is not authorized on MyDB to execute this particular comment. So we can see that our reader role and reader writer role is working fine here. Okay. So let's move ahead with the demo. Okay. So uh, we have seen that we can use the secret access request to get user credentials for the database. Now, uh, another method that we want to discuss is using the secret role binding CRD. So what is a secret role binding? So a uh, secret role binding is a Kubernetes CRD, which allows a DB admin to bind a set of roles to a set of DB users. So using secret role binding, 
it's possible to bound bind some particular roles to some sets of users. So the DB admin can take some roles and take the DB users and apply the secret rule binding and it will generate the vault policy and vault policy binding. Okay. And it will contain all the necessary permissions for those particular users. So let's apply our secret rule binding. And before that, I definitely want to show you the YAML here. So here is our secret rule binding YAML. So we can see the kind is secret rule binding and the name and namespace is also provided there. And the roles that we are going to use here is MongoDB role, which is the reader role. And this role is going to be bounded to the subjects that is used here, okay? So let's create our service account first. So we have created a service account, which is used here. Now let's apply the secret role binding. So we can see the secret rule binding is created here and it has also created vault policy and vault policy binding that we can see here. Now we can see its detail in a bit more. Let's get the vault policy. So we can see the vault policy that has been created via this secret rule binding, which basically gives this user permission in a particular path that is required for him to generate dynamic credentials. And we can also check the vault policy binding. So we can see the vault policy binding here, which is referring to the policy that is also created and the subject reference section, we can see the service account details and the vault reference section, we can see the name of the vault. And this role is created that we're going to use in a while to inject our secret into a Kubernetes pod. So now how we're going to use the secret access request or this particular service account. Let's say we want to mount our secret credentials into a Kubernetes resource. Let's say a Kubernetes pod, for instance. So we want to mount those secrets into a pod. So for that particular purpose, the DB user can create a secret provider class. So a secret provider class is a kind, as we can see the kind here. So we are using basically the secret store CSR driver here. And we have also put the name and the namespace and we're using the vault specific provider. We need to provide the vault address here and the role name that I just, just show that is that has been created via the secret role binding. And we want to read the Mongo username and the password and mount them into a Kubernetes pod. So I can also show you the YAML of the pod here that we're going to apply in a while. So in our pod, we uh, specified the name and the namespace and the service account name that we have created during the secret role binding. And we have specified a particular image here. We want to mount our secret into this particular path. And we have uh, provided the volume section here. And in the secret provider class section, we provided the name which will be used from the secret provider class CRT. So let's apply the secret provider class CRT. So I have created the secret provider class. Now I want to provide the pod to mount the secrets in them. Let's keep watching. <clears throat> so our pod, it has uh, already, the secret has been mounted and the pod has started running. We can exit into the pod to make sure that the secret is there.
So we can see the directory where the secrets are mounted. Let's check into it. So we can see the Mongo credit password and Mongo credit username is there. Let's cat one. So we can see a particular username that has been generated and we can also see the Mongo password here. Yes. So we see that we have successfully mounted or injected our secrets into a Kubernetes pod using the secret role binding. So that was all for the demo purpose. So for the roadmap and what we are going to work next, uh, uh, here are some details for you guys. So we want to back up the vault data using the stash by apps code. And we are also working on the Keep vault user interface part. And we are also want to enable our Keep vault CLI for retrieving vault root token. Sometimes it can be really tedious to get the vault root token and decrypt them from the cloud providers. And we also want to enable our Keep vault CLI to generate the secret provider class so it will be more user convenient. So now if you have any questions, feel free to ask them or in the Zoom chat. Hey guys. Uh, hi. Yeah. So thank you nice for the demo. Yeah, please go ahead. I see a few questions in the uh, Zoom chat. So uh, yeah, please go ahead. And I will also read the questions that's in there. So. Thank, thank you very much. By the way, very awesome presentation. And like it's a good like to have right now also the world provider for QDB for usability. I have one question about the world. So do you planning any uh, possibility in the future integrate also <clears throat> manage it uh, PKI uh, certificate storage to the world for like for example if you go through QDB and allow to ports and CRD issue certificate from the world instead of some uh, uh, operators. Yeah so it is actually already uh, supported so if you provision a database using QDB and uh, turn on uh, TLS support uh, that database, uh, so so use SART Manager for that. So if you want to provision your uh, TLS certificates, basically have the CA certificate authority managed by Vault. So then you can create a CA issuer uh, in uh, issuer in uh, certificate manager that points to this Vault server, which has been deployed by Cube Vault. So that way you will be able to uh, completely uh, you know manage your certificates. Uh, for this database, uh, which are actually uh, provisioned by this vault server. Yeah. Cool, very cool, thank you. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm gonna go to the Zoom chat and uh, we'll try to answer the questions here. So I see a question from uh, Jia Wan. Sorry if I wanna butcher your name. Uh, so the question was, uh, where do you create my DB? So in this case, the database MongoDB, um, my DB was created or deployed in this uh, Kubernetes cluster. But uh, you can uh, also probe, uh, you know, uh, deploy this database to a remote cluster or just connect to a remote cluster. So when you are so, saw those database YAMLs, if you uh, go back to those uh, slides, I mean, uh, maybe uh, I can share my screen here or, or yeah, you can. Sure. Sure. If, yeah, if you, no, no, yeah. So if you go back to the slides in the secret engine, um, yeah. So here, like when you are pointing to this MongoDB database ref, uh, uh, MongoDB, it is actually uh, pointing to uh, what we call a app binding. So if you are deploying a Kubernetes database, a database in Kubernetes using KubeDB. At the end of the provisioning process, it will create a custom resource uh, called app binding. Maybe you can go to the terminal and show us what is in there in your cluster. So it basically has a uh, Kubernetes uh, secret and the service for the database. So, so if your database is running outside the Kubernetes cluster or a remote cluster, you could effectively create the same app binding custom resource in your cluster uh, where the vault server is running and then uh, effectively you know, provided the connection information. So this is basically getting the connection information from the app binding. So uh, 
uh, yeah, so, so Sakib, if you would go to the terminal. Sure. Uh, yeah, and if we do kubectl uh, get app binding uh, for the database namespace. Yeah, yeah, so if you show us the YAML for this. Yeah, so, so what you can see is the, um, if we expand this section on the top. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just expand it. No, 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 just right click on it and expand, yeah. Yeah. So, this is... so yeah, so here in the spec section, you can see the, it has the client config service. So uh, if it is in the same cluster, you can point to a Kubernetes service, but then if it is a remote cluster, you can also typically provide a connection URL. And then it has the secret, which has the username and password basically for this uh, connection. Uh, for uh, This is the root root uh, username and password for this database, uh, or the admin username and password for this database. And then uh, in the parameter section, we, we can some provide some additional information. This is used when you are doing a backup. So in this particular case, this parameter section is not really used, uh, but uh, it could be useful you know, in other scenarios. So now, uh, yeah, so to go back to the question, basically uh, this is what uh, you know, the vault operator, the cube vault operator is looking at to connect to the database. So it could be in the same cluster, it could be in a remote cluster, as long as it can connect, uh, basically the vault server can connect to this uh, database, MongoDB database, or you know, the, let's say you do Postgres or MySQL, uh, it will be able to manage your user management, uh, user through this interface or these custom resources. So uh, that is the question. Now um, I see a question from Pavo. So if there would be, let's say multiple MongoDB interfaces, instances where it is specified which DB to provision the user. It is one secret engine always connected to a specific instance of DB can developer request access to MongoDB without knowing which physical instance will it be? So if we go back to the secret engine YAML um, to the, in the presentation that Sakib. Uh, yeah, so, so the here, uh, the secret engine is always connected to one specific uh, database. So if you have two different databases, then uh, you, know, you, you have to create a different secret engine and inside the vault server, they will be, you know, automatically provisioned in a different path. Basically, you know, vault server usually does everything based on their kind of URL path uh, in their API. So it will be on a different path. And then when the user is ac uh, requesting access, a database user is requesting access, they have to point to this specific uh, secret engine. So if you can go to the secret access request uh, slide, Yeah, so here user has to point to this uh, specific MongoDB role with that name. And the role is always connected to a specific MongoDB. I mean, if, if it is in the previous slide. So yeah, so uh, in other way, you know, the user cannot really just connect. Uh, user has to know uh, for which DB they want to connect to and they have to make a request for that and then they should be able to connect. And if they want different uh, requests to different uh, MongoDB databases in the same cluster, they have to create different uh, secret access requests uh, to do that. And this secret access request, uh, yeah, so they, they can create those and then we will to basically get a Kubernetes secret with the username and password. So Pavo, did I answer your question here? Okay, um, yeah, so uh, now there was another question. Is secret store CSI recommended over vault injector? So the secret store CSI driver, it is recommended uh, because this uh, allows you to basically mount the secrets inside the pod. So this is uh, this has the other advantage is that if you are on cloud and if using, you know, if, if you are using say cloud providers, uh, secret management system, right? So you cannot really use a cloud provider secret management system for database user, user management, but maybe you have other types of secrets 
that you have uh, stored in the cloud provider secret management, like Google has their KSM, uh, Key Store Manager, AWS has their own KSM. So those uh, those things, and the benefit of using the secret store CSI driver is that you know you kind of you can keep your Kubernetes YAMLs almost same. I mean, if you go to the secret uh, provider class YAML uh, where you are basically provide the secret keys. I mean, Sakib, if you go to the yeah, sure, yes. Yeah, so here, I mean, if you uh, effectively use a, you know, defined KSM instead of vault, then, you know, this parameter sections has to change, but but rest of your application kind of can stay the same. So that's why, you know, we, uh, I, I think even the, in the Kubernetes community, people usually recommend using uh, this. But obviously, uh, you know, you can also use the alternative mechanism like using vault injector uh, that will also works, right? So you can use vault injector to basically inject uh, the keys in the environment or in the pod. I mean, I think HashiCorp has a few different uh, uh, solutions uh, around this. So, so this is, uh, and uh, to be clear, the, um, when you install the uh, CSI driver vault provider, that is actually maintained by HashiCorp itself. So, so you know, it's kind of their official solution too. Um, yeah, so now the, there is a question about, uh, uh, you know, this will mount uh, secrets as a file instead of environment variables. We usually prefer the environment variables uh, that application reads directly. Yeah, so, so yeah, so you, the, the, you know, these will be mounted as files, but you know, just to be clear, even though these are files, these are actually stored in the RAM FS. So these are not like actually kind of physical files in the file system. So, you know, if you're sort of basically node dies, you know, instantly, uh, the data will not be left on a disk. So the, it is kind of safe from that perspective. Uh, and then if you want to export in uh, to this to an environment, yes, you could do that. Frankly, you know, you could uh, even do with the CSI driver approach. What you could do is uh, before you you start in in the pod argument section, basically you can add a few exports command, right? Like you can basically play, play tricks with that. So basically do bash dash c, and then export the file. Uh, basically, you know, cat the file to an environment variable, and in that way you can also instead of wanting to read the file, you can export you know the mounted secrets in the environment. So that is one option. The other option that we actually did not show, but it is available on the uh, secret store Kubernetes website uh, on the project website is that they can also give you a, just a standard Kubernetes secret that you can mount. And in that case, you will be able to use the, you know, the ENV from approach in the Kubernetes pod YAML to basically read the secret from the uh, so getting the, the secret data from the that Kubernetes secret and export into the environment variable. So either way, you, you could also do that uh, through this uh, CSI driver approach. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, yeah, Andrew's also mentioned that. So that's. Uh, uh, how will uh, Vault interact with database load balancer that also provide authentication? Example, proxy SQL. Um, so the way kind of Vault works is that uh, it is, uh, you know, providing you credentials uh, for, you know, sort of, I would say the restricted credentials for your databases. So, so, you know, like, let's say in this case, we're talking about proxy SQL. So the actual database may be MySQL or MariaDB. So you can create those uh, limited uh, credential accounts there and then expose those through proxy SQL. Uh, I don't believe that is a uh, built-in solution for uh, where uh, Vault can manage credentials for proxy SQL. So if you are going with proxy SQL directly, you probably have to just create those credentials ahead of time. Uh, I mean, so, you know, with Proxy SQL, I suppose you have to create credentials on both ends, um, you know, on the server side and also on the client side. So you have to create those manually, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we can also take a look into this a little bit more and see what is a better option available. But I don't think there is a, right now we don't have a built-in support for, for Proxy SQL. We do have support for MySQL if you are, or MariaDB if you connect to that directly. 
Um, so that question was from Eli. Uh, yeah, so uh, is anybody else have any questions? I see a raised hands, uh, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. I see from Nikita. Um, okay. Uh, anybody else have any other question? So this is already available uh, in the latest version of the Cube Vault release. I think uh, this has been, uh, you know, we've been working on this for a while. Uh, I mean, you know, just on this project, but you know, eventually we got those um, custom resources figured out, like how we make them sort of self-service because, uh, you know, like coming up with those three sort of different personas where there is the vault uh, administrator or the cluster administrator who provisions vault as a kind of a cluster service. And then making sure that the database admin can deploy a database and, and then effectively connect vault as a secret engine. So other users can use that mechanism for uh, provisioning credentials. Uh, and then uh, there is the, the secret uh, role binding and also all the, all the access request, right? So there's a two mode, right? One is like a kind of a request approval mode. You know, I would assume that this is more for a human focused approach, right? Like if some human being wants to access, that's probably how you won't go with that. But then if you want to give a service account access, then you can do the service role binding approach where your service account from a different namespace gets access and then you can mount a pod and or, or you know, export environment variables. So that way, I think it kind of covers, uh, I, you know, in our view, all that sort of the important use cases. Obviously, we are happy to hear, you know, if you have more feedback or more diff different types of use cases that you may have, which uh, maybe could be better supported in future. So you can always uh, email us at hello at appscode.com or support at appscode.com. Um, and some of you have already kind of contacted us uh, already. So you can you know just reach out through those channels too. Uh, we have a Twitter channel. You can follow that for just usually just product, project updates and product releases. Um, so thank you everybody for joining today. It was great talking to you all, uh, give, showing this demo um, and see you next time uh, in two weeks, hopefully. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much guys. Thank you.